Now we will go through the tracks of the spinal cord. Now I told you there are two types of tracks are there ascending tracks and descending tracks. The sensory information from the receptors throughout the most of the body is relayed to the brain by means of ascending tracks fibers that conducts the impulses up to the spinal cord. So, from outside the body the sensory information once it reaches the spinal cord it passed through this ascending tracks and reaches the brain. When the brain directs the motor activities these directions the, from the central nervous system or brain the brain it forms the nerve impulses and travel down to through the spinal cord through the tracks only. So, travels down the spinal uh, through the sp travel down the spinal cord through the descending tracks. Ascending tracks are the as tracks which carry signals in the spinal cord. Typically three types of neurons are available in the ascending tracks in the tracks. The first order there are first order neuron, there are second order neuron, there are third order neuron. First order neuron it detects the stimulus and carries into the spinal cord. So, first there are first order neuron, it carries, it detects the stimulus and carries into the spinal cord. Second order neuron is seen within the spinal cord. It is continuous to the thalamus to the sensory that is thalamus is the sensory relay station. So, second order neuron in the spinal cord carries to the thalamus. Then third order neuron it carries signals from thalamus to the sensory region of the cerebral cortex. So, once you say the ascending tracks the prefix will be spino. For example, the spino thalamic tract or uh, spino reticular tracts, spino cerebellar tracts. The tracts which prefix spino means these are the ascending tracts. So, it is having three neurons a first order neuron that is uh, detect the impulse and carries impulse a stimulus and carries to the spinal cord second order neuron it can it is in the spinal cord and it and it reaches till the thalamus and a third order neuron which carries signal from thalamus to the to the sensory region of the cerebral cortex now which are the ascending tracks these are dorsal column tract dorsal column tract, spinothalamic tract, spinoreticular tract and spino uh, cerebellar tracts are the ascending tracts. So, dorsal column tract, dorsal spinothalamic tract, spinoreticular tract and uh, spino cerebellar tracts are the descending tracts, ascending tracts. Then descending tracts are the motor tracts these are pyramidal tracts, these can be divided into pyramidal tracts and extra pyramidal tracts. Pyramidal tract include lateral corticospinal and anterior corticospinal tract. Then extra pyramidal tract includes rubrospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, olivospinal tract and vestibulospinal tract. So, we were discussing about the ascending tracts. The first ascending tract is the dorsal column tract. Dorsal column tract is a tract which, uh, which carries sensations related to the discriminative, discriminative touch, visceral pain, vibration and proprioception. Discriminative touch, visceral pain, vibration and proprioception is carried through dorsal column tract to the brain. Now, it is having again three neurons, the first order neuron. <coughs> first order neuron, it detect the stimulus. There is fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus is there. Fasciculus gracilis carries sensation from below T6 and fasciculus cuneatus carries sensation from T6 or higher level. And there is second order neuron, it synapses with the first order neuron in the medulla and its deposits. Then the third order it travels up and the third order neuron synapses with the second order neuron 
at the thalamus and carries signals to the cerebral cortex that is at the post central gyrus. The system it is a contralateral system. So, the, this is the dorsal colon tract, it is a tract which uh, carries sensation of discriminative touch, visceral pain, proprioception and vibration. Next type of ascending tract is the spinothalamic tract or spinothalamic pathway. Now, spinothalamic pathway is the pathway or tract which carries sensation of pain, pressure, temperature, light touch, tickle and itch. It is located in the anterior and lateral columns. Then deposition of the second order neuron occurs in the spinal cord and third order neuron arise again at the thalamus level and continue to the cerebral cortex of the post central gyrus. So, second the ascending tract is the spinothalamic tract. Next there is we have the spinoreticular tract especially it carries the pain signal from, uh, from a tissue injury site. So, the deficit in the spinal cord and ascend uh, as thala with the spinothalamic fibers and end with reticular formation. Third and fourth new order neurons are the it continue to the thalamus and cerebral cortex. So, there are spinal fourth, third and fourth order neurons are present in the spinoreticular tract. Next ascending tract is the spinocerebellar tract. In the spinocerebellar tract, the first order neuron originate in the muscles and tendon. In the second order neuron ascend in the ipsilateral, ipsilateral lateral column and it terminate in the cerebellum <coughs> and it transmit proprioceptive signals from the limbs and the trunk. So, spinocerebellar tracts to tra for the transmission of proprioceptive signals from the limbs and trunk. So, these were the ascending tracts or the sensory tracts. Now, there are descending tracts especially motor tracts. So, there are two types of descending tracts are there. These are a direct pathway and indirect pathway. Direct pathway that is called pyramidal tract and indirect pathway it is called extra pyramidal tract. Now, this motor pathway or descending tracts include two types of neuron. There is upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron. Upper motor neuron begins with the begins with the soma in the cerebral cortex or brain stem and lower motor neuron uh, that is in the soma in the anterior horn axon leads to the muscle. Now, we we can divide the uh, we can divide it the tracks into two types the descending tracks into two types that is pyramidal tracks or pyramidal system. It is also called the corticospinal tracks and an extra pyramidal system. Now, we will discuss about the pyramidal system or corticospinal tract. These are the direct system, direct pathways which originate from the pyramidal neurons in the percentile gyri in the, in the brain. Now, pyramidal neuron is in upper motor neuron, is in the upper motor neuron and it forms the corticospinal tracts. The upper motor neuron synapses in the anterior horn with the lower motor neuron. Then this lower motor neuron activate the skeletal muscles. The direct pathway, this direct pathway regulate fast and fine skill movements. That is, this fast movement and skilled movement is directed by the, the, the direct, the pyramidal tract. Now, lat there are two types of pyramidal tracts are there. There are two parts are there. There is a lateral corticospinal tract and anterior corticospinal tract. In lateral corticospinal tract, upper motor nerve, upper motor neuron deposits in the pyramids of the medulla and in the anterior corticospinal tract, upper motor neuron deposits at the spinal cord at the spinal cord level. Now, there are some, some other descending system other than the pyramidal system. This is, these are called extra pyramidal system. Now, its upper motor neuron originates in nuclei deep in the cerebrum and upper motor neuron does not pass through the pyramids and lower motor neuron is in the anterior horn of the motor neuron. It is at the uh, lower motor neuron is an anterior horn motor neuron and this system includes the indirect system or extra pyramidal system includes rubrospinal tract, 
vestibular spinal tract, reticular spinal tract and tecto spinal tract. So, <coughs> these are not like pyramidal system this in the extra pyramidal system is multi synaptic. Now, the different extra pyramidal system we already uh, named it tecto spinal tract, reticular spinal tract, vestibular spinal tracts and rubro spinal tract. Tecto spinal tract the reflux it is the, the produces the reflux turning of the head in response to the sight and sound. Reticular spinal tract this function is it control the limb movement important to maintain the post it is so it is important to maintain the posture and balance. So, reticular spinal tract controls the limb movements. So, it is important to maintain the posture and balance. Next is the vestibular spinal tract that is uh, especially its main function is postural muscle activity uh, that is controlled. And rubro spinal tract it originates from the red nucleus of the midbrain and it controls the flexor muscles. Now, we will be discussing about the spinal nerves. So, we already discussed is that spinal nerve is a part of the peripheral nervous system. There are 31 pairs of the spinal nerve that is 8 at the cervical level, 12 at the thoracic level, 5 at lumbar level, 5 at sacral level and 1 at coccygeal level. Now, how the spinal nerves are formed? It is for each spinal nerve is formed by the union of the anterior and posterior roots in the intervertebral foramen. Now, the anterior root it contain the motor fibers for the skeletal muscle. Those from the those from the T1 to T, T so anterior root it contain the motor fibers for the skeletal muscle. Those from T1 to L, L2 contain sympathetic fibers. S2 and S4 contain parasympathetic fibers. Posterior root contain the sensory fibers whose cell bodies are in the spinal ganglion. So, it is formed from the posterior and anterior root. The spinal nerves are formed from anterior and posterior root. Now, once we see the functional component, we can see there are four functional components are there for the spinal nerves. There is a somatic efferent nerve fiber is there. There is a visceral efferent nerve fiber is there. Somatic efferent nerve fiber, afferent nerve fiber is there and visceral afferent nerve fiber is there. Somatic efferent nerve fiber is the fibers that transmit motor impulse from spinal cord to the skeletal muscle. Visceral efferent nerve fiber is fiber that transport that trans or transmit the motor impulse from spinal cord to the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle or glands. These are the visceral efferent nerve fiber. So, afferent is just opposite of that. That is somatic afferent nerve fiber means the fibers that transmit uh, uh, fr that transmit extraceptive and proprioceptive impulse that is sensory impulse from body to the spinal cord. Visceral means the fibers that transmit impulses from viscera to the spinal cord. So, functionally it is having four component, if the functionally a spinal nerve is having four component, these are the somatic efferent, visceral efferent, somatic afferent, visceral afferent. Now, what is a nerve plexus? We might have heard lots of regarding the nerve plexus like brachial plexus, like lumbar plexus, like cervical plexus. What is the, what is meant by nerve plexus? It is a complex interwoven network of the nerve. It is called nerve plexus. Three large plexus are seen at the body. These are cervical plexus, brachial plexus and lumbosacral plexus. The lumbosacral plexus can be further divided into lumbar plexus, sacral plexus. So, nerve plexus means plex, uh, this is a complex or there is a complex interwoven nerves. So, mainly three types of plexus are seen in the body cervical plexus, brachial plexus and lumbosacral plexus. Now, we might have heard upper neuron, upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. What is upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron? Upper motor neuron means the motor neurons that originate from the motor region of the cerebral cortex or brain stem and carry the motor information down to the final common pathway. That is any motor neuron that are not directly responsible for region, uh, 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 stimulating the targeting muscle is known as upper motor neuron. And 
the 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 motor neuron which directly responsible for stimulating the target muscle is known as lower motor neuron so that is the difference between upper and lower motor neuron lower motor neuron means the motor neuron connecting the brain stem and spinal cord to the muscle fiber bringing the nerve impulses from upper motor neuron to the muscle or from the to the muscle to the uh, central nervous system a motor neuron a lower motor neuron axon terminates at the muscle so a motor neurons axon terminates at the muscle it's called lower motor neuron and uh, uh, which is not in contact with the effector muscle it's called upper motor neuron now what is a motor unit motor unit can be defined as a single motor neuron and the group of muscle that muscle fibers it is innervated so all muscle fiber is in a single motor unit consist of the same muscle fiber type now a muscle fi a single motor neuron and the muscle fibers supplied by the uh, by this motor neuron is considered as a motor unit now we discussed about the spinal cord it's having lots of functions so there are lots of tracks passing through the spinal cord so it's having both motor and sensory tracks are passing through what will happen once the spinal cord may get injured usually the spinal cord may get damaged usually during any trauma or any diseases or road even during road traffic accidents so spinal cord injury is damaged the causes damage to the spinal cord and which result in loss of function of the spinal cord so both motor and chance so there is may be chance of motor and sensory function may get affected so the frequent causes are the trauma and diseases so that spinal cord may get damaged it causes loss of function uh, loss of function completely and partially that is both sensory and motor function may get affected because both motor and sensory pathway passes through the spinal cord now what are the different types of spinal cord paralysis depending upon the location and extent of injury the different forms of paralysis can occur that is once there is motor, uh, once there is a spinal cord injury sometimes it may cause paralysis so what where is the uh, how much type how much injury is there how much what is the location of the injury then the paralysis may differ monoplegia means paralysis of one limb diplegia means paralysis of both upper or both or lower limbs paraplegia means paralysis of both lower limb hemiplegia means paralysis of upper limb torso and lower limb of the one side of the body so if the paralysis on one side of the body is called hemiplegia quadriplegia means paralysis of all four limbs now what will happen what each will go through what will happen if there is spinal cord injury at each level if the injury is at the cervical level at c1 between c1 and c3 all daily functions all daily activities must be totally assisted breathing will be dependent on ventilator motorized wheelchair controlled by sip and puff or chin movement is required at this stage now if the injury if the spinal cord injury at is at c4 level the all the things all the uh, all the conditions will be almost same as that of c1 and c3 but breathing gets spared that is breathing can be done without a ventilator now if the paralysis it at such c5 level there will be proper good heck, uh, head and neck shoulder movements as well as elbow flexion but still electrical wheelchair is required for and short distance with the support of some person he can move movement can be done now if is it is at c6 level wrist flexion wrist extension movement will be good uh, but assistance needed for dressing transition of the bed to the chair or car 
may be needed assistance. If C7 and C8 level is at the C7 and C8, all the hand movement will get spared, all the hand movement will get, uh, all uh, will get the all hand movements and ability to dress, eat, drive, do transfer and do upper body washes. Now, if the paralysis at, at the thoracic level, that is even if at T1 and to T4, normal communication skills may be there, help only may be only be needed for heavy, heavy uh, that is loading wheelchair into a car, etc. If it is T5 to T9, manual wheelchair can be done for every day daily living and independent for personal care. And if it is at T10 to L1, partial paralysis of the lower body will be there. If it, if it is between L2 and S5, some knee, hip and foot movements with possible slow difficult walking with the assistance or aids. Only heavy home maintenance and hard cleaning will need assistance. Now, now the spinal cord injury, these are these we were discussing about the uh, complete injuries, complete cut. Spinal cord injury may be uh, complete or incomplete. So, spinal cord syndrome can be classified either a complete or incomplete categories. Complete is characterized by complete loss of motor and sensory function below the level of traumatic lesion. Incomplete is characterized by different neurological findings that is partial loss of sensor, partial loss of motor function below the lesion. So, injury may be the spinal cord injury may be partial or uh, complete. So, complete means all the motor function and sensory function will be below the level get affected, but incomplete some uh, functions will, get, is, will be spared and this, there will be partial loss of sensory or motor functions. Now, central so will partial lesion, we will go through some partial lesion. So, so, first one is a central cord lesion usually involves in the cervical region. It usually result from the cervical hyper extension causing an ischemic injury to the central part of the cord. So, central part of the cord get affected. So, there will be motor weakness is present in the upper limb than lower limb. So, this as the central cord is get affected, in the central cord syndrome, there will be motor weakness will be more in the upper limb than the lower limb. Then, then patient more likely to lose the pain and temperature sensation than the proprioception. Patient may complain of burning feeling in the upper limbs and more commonly seen in older patients with cervical arthritis and narrowing of the spinal cord. So, central cord syndrome means the center part will get affected. So, usually there will be upper limb will be affected than lower limb and uh, patients may complain of burning feeling in the upper limb and they may lose pain and temperature, but since uh, but uh, proprioception may get spared. Next type of lesion is the brown sequard lesion. In brown sequard lesion, one side of the spinal cord, one side, one half of the spinal cord may get affected. That is, it's brown sequard syndrome may result from an injury only to, to only half of the spinal cord and is most noticed in cervical region again. It is of, uh, usually a tumor or a trauma or inflammation may cause down sequard syndrome. So, there will be motor loss is evident on the same side as the injury to the spinal cord. Sensory loss is evident on the opposite side, especially on the opposite side of the location. Then, Bowel and bladder will be normal. Person is normally able to walk through some bracing or, stab or a stability device may be required. The next one is the anterior spinal cord syndrome. It is usually uh, result from a compression of the artery that runs along in front of the spinal cord. So, compression of the spinal cord may form, uh, uh, may, be, may be from a uh, bone fragment or a large his. Uh, the herniation. Even a bone fragment or a 
uh, he, disc herniation may cause compression of the anterior spinal cord syndrome. Patient with anterior spinal cord syndrome have a variable amount of motor function below the level of injury depends upon which area which track is get which side of the anterior side is get affected. Sensation to the pain and temperature also lo are lost while the sensitivity to the vibration and proprioception are preserved. So, these are the different types of the spinal cord uh, paralysis that is spinal cord injury. It may be a partial injury or a complete injury that is partial in, uh, that is sp partial injury is again central cord syndrome is the brown sac cord syndrome and anterior spinal cord syndrome. Now, this session we discussed about the anatomy and anatomy of the spinal cord and it is regarding the covering the meninges and it is part of the meninges. We discussed about the spaces and we discussed about the cerebrospinal fluid, how it is formed and how it is circulated and we will discuss then we discussed about how the uh, about the anatomy of the spinal cord and regarding the gram matter. Then we discussed about the tracts of the spinal cord including the ascending tracts are there and descending tracts are there, ascending tracts are the sensory tracts and descending tracts are the motor tracts. And so there are spinal nerves are there and nerve plexus are there and that is all. Dan Cephalon is the midline structure which is, la which is largely embedded in the cerebrum and it is so it is as it is embedded inside it is hidden from the surface view. Now, Dan Cephalon is having two parts a dorsal part and a ventral part. Dorsal part consists of thalamus, metathalamus and epithalamus. Dorsal part is having three parts again that is thalamus, metathalamus and epithalamus. The ventral part consists of subthalamus and hypothalamus. So, diencephalon is can be divided into two parts a dorsal part and a ventral part. The dorsal part consists of thalamus, metathalamus, epithalamus, ventral part, subthalamus and hypothalamus. Now, we will be discussing about thalamus. Thalamus is a major station, it is a station where all impulses is transferred, it is uh, all uh, impulses relay through the thalamus. That is, it is a major station where all specific sensory impulses except smell relay before terminating into the cerebral cortex. Now, so even the cerebral cortex is damaged, crude sensory perception for example, like pain remains present because thalamus acts as a crude center for sense of perception. So, thalamus is a relay station or it is a station where all the sensory impulse are transferred to the cerebral cortex. So, in even it is act as a crude center for especially uh, the impulses like crude impulses like pain because in case of even the so even when the cerebral cortex is damaged crude perception can, can uh, remain intact because of the presence of thalamus. So, it is a thalamus is main function is it is a relay station between outside and the cerebral cortex. Now, almost majority of the ascending impulses, non-specific ascending impulses from reticular activating system relay through the thalamus, through the thalamic nucleus, especially through the thalamic nuclei before produce, before it reaches to the cerebral cortex. And it is having intimate connection with the frontal cortex. And, uh, bec uh, and hypothalamus. Thalamus is also involved in the per feeling of personality and different emotions. So, it is having connection with the hypothalamus and it is associated with the frontal cortex also. So, it is having a role in the uh, subjective feeling of personality and various other emotions. Next part is the hypothalamus. Now, thalamus and hypothalamus together we can call it as dancephalon. 
it is seen at the it is lies at the lateral wall of the third ventricle now it can be considered as a head ganglion of the autonomic nervous system because it take part in the control of many visceral and metabolic activities of the body so hypothalamus we can call it as a head ganglion or head of autonomic nervous system because it's having lots of visceral and metabolic functions we'll go through what are its different functions of thalamus hypothalamus so different functions of hypothalamus the first one is the first thing is that the most important function of hypothalamus is the endocrine control it produces lots of inhibiting and releasing hormones and uh, by forming by forming this releasing uh, the, the releasing and inhibiting hormone it regulates the anterior pituitary especially the it produces uh, inhibiting and releasing hormone which which uh, control the endocrine functions of anterior pituitary so this hormone they, they are having it produces releasing and inhibiting hormone the releasing hormones are ghrh that is growth hormone releasing hormone trh that is thyrotropin releasing hormone and grh gonadotropin releasing hormone so it produces this endo in endocrine control it produces three types of hormones three types of releasing hormones that is growth hormone releasing hormone thyrotropin releasing hormone and gonadotropin releasing hormone it produces two in inhibitory hormones also so these are somatostatin that is growth hor uh, growth hormone inhibiting hormone and prolactin inhibiting hormone so the it uh, through this releasing and inhibiting hormone this hypothalamus controls the anterior pituitary so growth hormone releasing hormone thyrotropin releasing hormone gonadotropin releasing hormone growth hormone inhibiting hormone and prolactin inhibiting hormone are the hormones which uh, releasing and inhibiting hormone or controlling hormones uh, which which is produced by hypothalamus now instead of this uh, the other functions are it can produce it's having other endocrine functions like it can produce hormones also the, the first one is a, it's 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 having a function of neurosecretion so it produces oxytocin and vasopressin these are the main hormones which is produced by hypothalamus and after Uh, producing this oxytocin and vasopressin it is released it is transported to the posterior pituitary and posterior pituitary it uh, act as only as a storage organ so hypothalamus produces the oxytocin and vasopressin and it is stored in the posterior pituitary now it's having hypothalamus is having functions on the a, auto, a, uh, ans that is autonomic nervous system that is especially the anterior part of the hypothalamus it mediate the sympathetic activity so hypothalamus controls the autonomic nervous system so it can control the cardiovascular system it can produce control the respiratory system and it can control the elementary functions also so the hypothalamus is having the autonomic effect also it controls the autonomic nervous system the symb it mediate the sympathetic activity now it the next function of hypothalamus is it's having temperature regulation function so there will be a balance between heat production and heat loss between in the body so there are lots of mechanism which controls the heat production and which controls the uh, which controls the, that is uh, the temperature of the body so once there is a raised temperature it causes vaso there will be vaso dilatation and sweating it gives the information for vaso dilatation and sweating and it controls the temperature so once there is vaso dilatation there will be the the blood will be uh, the there will be more movement of the blood or well and the distribution of the uh, heat at different parts of the body and the body controls the heat and next mechanism of heat control is uh, sweating and once there is a lowered temperature is there so body itself especially through mediated by hypothalamus there will be vaso constriction and there will be shivering it also produces heat so temperature regulation is especially done by hypothalamus so it is it is by uh, that is it once there is a decrease in the heat so the it it, it makes it uh, hypothalamus 
regulate and it uh, increase the vasoconstriction and shivering and produces more heat and along with that if there is an increased heat there if there is a raised heat by doing vasodilatation and sweating it controls or it depresses the heat now next function of hypothalamus is the regulation of food and water intake that is there is a feeding center and a satiative satiative center is there in the hypothalamus the feeding center is situated laterally and satiative uh, satiative center is situated in the me, in the medial side so for example for example if there is stimulation of the feeding center it causes hungry so the person may take more food or if there is a stimulation of satiative center the person the person will uh, feel like uh, the the person won't feel hungry and there will be hyperphagia and uh, either is there will be hypophagia if there is stimulation of the satiative center there will be hypophagia so stimulation of the feeding center or the damage of the satiative center causes a hyperphagia that which leads to obesity now if there is stimulation of the satiative center and damage to the feeding center causes hypophagia or even aphagia so regulation of the food intake is done by hypothalamus there is a feeding center and a satiative center which center is getting stimulated depends upon that the person may feel hungry uh, uh, hyperphagia or aphagia or even hypophagia now there is a drinking center is also situated in the lateral part of the hypothalamus so it this also controls how much thirst the person is so hypothalamus always regulate the food and water intake also so it is the feeding center is placed on the lateral side of the hypothalamus and the satiative center is situated placed on the medial side of the hypothalamus again drinking center is on the lateral part of the hypothalamus so that this is the method how it this is the regulation of uh, the food and water intake now it's having control on sexual and reproduction activities so we already discussed it's have it produces some releasing hormone and inhibiting hormone so through there is a gonadotropin it produces gonadotropin uh, releasing hormone and it controls the uh, it uh, through the control it control through anterior pituitary it control the gametogenesis it uh, very it uh, various it controls the various reproductive cycles and it produces maturation and maintenance of secondary sexual characters now another function of hypothalamus is that it control the biological clock there is a rhythm in the body there is a biological clock in the body and hypothalamus is the center which control the biological clock and next is emotion fear rage pleasure reward punishment all these are controlled by hypothalamus along with the limbic system and prefrontal cortex so we were discussing about the functions of hypothalamus uh, the the there it produces growth hormone releasing hormone so it it is having an endocrine control by control that is it control the anterior pituitary producing growth hormone releasing hormone thyrotropin releasing hormone then gonadotropin releasing hormone uh, somatostatin and prolactin inhibiting hormone then it having it secretes or it produces oxytocin and vasopressin so it can be considered as a chief the mediator or chief part of the uh, autonomic activity and it regulate the temperature it regulates the food and water intake and it's having an active role in sexual and reproductive activities it controls the biological clock and along with the limbic system and prefrontal cortex it controls the emotion fear rage pleasure reward punishment etc now in case of lesion any injury or any uh, lesions of the hypothalamus so it causes obesity there is chance of obesity diabetes insipidus epilepsy sexual disturbances there may be disturbance in the sleep or disturbance in the uh, the biological clock 
there may be chance of hyperglycemia and even glucosuria. So any of the symptoms depends upon which part is affected or depends upon how much it is affected, any of the symptom may present. So there may be obesity, chance of obesity, diabetes insipidus, epilepsy may be the sexual disturbances may be the disturbance of uh, sleep and biological clock may be there, there may be chance of hyperglycemia and glucosuria. Next important structure in the brain is the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia is considered as it is a subcortical intracerebral mass of gray matter forming an important part of the extra pyramidal system. Basal ganglia is having mainly four parts. There is a corpus striatum, there is amygdaloid body, there is a claustrum and cordage. These are the different four parts of the basal ganglia. Corpus striatum, amygdaloid body, claustrum and cordage are the uh, diff four different parts of the basal ganglia. Now, what are the functions of basal ganglia? So, it is a necess it is necessary for normal tone and posture, and it is needed for all voluntary and associated movements. And it is associated as it is mainly its main function is initiation of voluntary movement, and it inhibits the appearance of static trauma. So, any lesions of the uh, this basal ganglia causes. That is, it will affect the tone and posture and it will affect the movement, especially the initiation of movement and it, it causes trauma, static trauma. So main functions of basal ganglia are, it is necessary for normal degree of tone and posture and it is needed for voluntary movement that is uh, starting or especially associated as well initiation, especially initiation of voluntary movement and associated movements and it inhibits the appearance of static trauma. Now, there may be chance of damage to this basal ganglia and the damage or lesions of the basal ganglia is known as Parkinsonism or Parkinson's syndrome. The causes may be idiopathic or a Wilson's disease which is there will be associated liver disease also. A viral, a, a viral infection of um, a viral infection of the brain may also may get affected the basal ganglia or a direct trauma or a traumatic brain injury. Even there are drug induced lesions are also there. So the causes may be an idiopathic without any cause or a Wilson's disease, a viral disease or a drug induced basal ganglia lesion or even a direct trauma, trauma may cause the lesions of the basal ganglia. Now, we already discussed that the functions of basal ganglia is mainly it is controls the normal degree and tone and it inhibits the chance of appearance of tremors and it is, it is a, one of the main area which controls the proper movement. Now, absence of uh, the, the any lesions of this basal ganglia causes a effect all these functions. So, the signs and symptoms of Parkinson's sonism is the first one is rigidity. Rigidity is the type of rigidity seen in uh, uh, the seen in Parkinsonism are leg pipe rigidity and cogwheel type of rigidity. Leg, leg pipe of leg pipe rigidity is, means that there will be rigidity throughout the movement and cogwheel rigidity is a jerking type of movement will be available. So, uh, there will be rigidity at intervals. Now, tremors. There will be a, the function of uh, basal ganglia is inhibition of tremors. Now, the basal the lesions of the basal ganglia can cause tremors. So, the tremors is usually resting type of tremors. Resting tremors are, can be seen. Now, hypokinesia or akinesia may be seen. That is, <coughs> there is decreased movement because basal ganglia is a structure which uh, which uh, controls the movement. So. The especially the voluntary movement. So, it causes a decrease in the movement or even difficult to start the movement. Then the muscles may be affected. The muscles, the, there will be, must, the movements of the muscle will be affected. Even the facial muscles will, want, will, be, uh, will get affected. It causes an expressionless face and that is the expressionless face and the face is known as masses facies. And the, the, there will be chance of choreas and there will be athetosis, athetosis and uh, 
pill rolling tremor may be the tremor the type of tremor is uh, rusting tremor or pill rolling type of tremors you can see and gait gait also will get uh, get affected the name of the gait is called a fascinating gait the patients the subjects will uh, the subjects will walk like he is as 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 if he is going to catch the center of gravity and the, the there will be short fast steps will be there so sign, once we go through the signs and symptoms of parkinsonism there will be cogwheel or left pipe of rigidity there will be rusting tremor there will be hypokinesia or akinesia there will be masses facies and there will be fascinating gait chorea and atetosis these are the major signs and symptoms of parkinsonism next structure is the next structure is the internal capsule internal capsule is a v shaped structure it's a large band of fibers situated in the inframedial part of the cerebral hemisphere now internal ca capsule contain the fibers coming and going out of the cortex now we can compare this internal capsule there are lots of fibers that is lots of there are, it contain lots of fibers going out and coming from the cerebral cortex so it can be compared as a narrow gate where the fibers are densely crowded so as almost all the fibers or important fibers passing through this internal capsule a small damage in the internal capsule can cause a wide spread of uh, derangement so internal capsule is a area v shaped area which contain lots of fibers which going to and coming back from the cerebral cortex so even a small lesions of the cerebral cortex causes wide spread of derangement now the one of the most important part of the cerebrum it's the cerebral cortex itself now once we see anatomically anatomically the cerebral cortex can be divided into three areas the four areas anatomically the cerebral cortex can be divided into four areas that is frontal parietal temporal and occipital lobes so cerebral cortex can be divided into frontal parietal temporal and occipital lobes now broadman have divided so the cerebral cortex into 47 areas different areas for different functions so major some major areas are motor area is area 4 there is a premotor area that is area 6 there is frontal eye field area 8 prefrontal area that is area 9 10 11 12 there is broca's area it's also called a speech area that is area 44 these are some major areas and we already discussed that is uh, uh, broadman divided the area cerebral cortex into different areas then we already discussed how the lobes are uh, the, how the cerebrum is divided into different lobes and the frontal lobe mainly controls the voluntary move voluntary control of the skeletal muscle is at the frontal lobe motivation aggression mood is also controlled then planning social judgment intelligence everything is controlled by the frontal area then parietal area is the major center for reception and evaluation of most of the sensory information but it excludes smell hearing and vision and it's the taste touch pressure temperature and pain is already the reception and evaluation of all mode all this most of these sensory information like taste uh, touch pressure temperature and pain is at the parietal lobe but smell hearing and vision are not there that is especially the special senses three important special senses are not there in the parietal lobe occipital lobe is the uh, area where it re receive and evaluate the vision and temporal lobe is the area which evaluate the a smell and hearing and uh, uh, then memory and visual recognition and emotions are uh, it are controlled by the temporal area so again the parts that frontal area mainly the voluntary control of the skeletal muscles and its intelligence motivation social judgment aggression planning mood etc is controlled by the frontal area then parietal area especially these are the sensory areas especially the it receives the it receives the sensation like taste touch pressure temperature pain and but occipital area is for vision and temporal area is for smell and hearing especially 
the memory, visual recognition and emotional behavior is a temporary area. Now there is a small part called insula. Insula is a part of the limbic system. It plays a role in understanding, understanding the spoken languages, taste and integrating sensory information from visual, visceral receptors, visceral receptors. So, motor, uh, motor areas of frontal lobes are the primary motor cortex are the premotor cortex are the Broca's area is the so primary the motor cortex consists of the primary motor cortex it controls the uh, voluntary contraction of the skeletal muscle and it contains the pyramidal cells which is the origin of the pyramidal tract so cerebral cerebrum consists of the motor area especially the frontal lobe consists of the motor areas it contain the it contain the primary motor cortex it controls the and the, especially the voluntary contraction of the skeletal muscle cells and it contain the pyramidal cells which causes which is the origin of the pyramidal tract. Then it contains the pre-motor cortex. It contains especially the extra pyramidal tracts and its main function is the coordination of the movements in a sequence. And much of the, uh, and next area is the Broca's area. Broca's area especially it controls the speech. Now cerebrum contains the sensory areas. The main sensory area is primary sensory cortex. It is seen at the parietal lobe, especially its main function is, is it controls the touch, pressure, temperature and pain. Now there is a visual cortex is there, it is seen at the occipital lobe. There is an audi auditory cortex, it is at the temporal lobe. There is an olfactory cortex, it is at again seen at the temporal lobe. And there is a gestatory cortex, it is at the insula and frontal lobe. So cerebrum consists of the the motor area, motor area consists of primary motor cortex, pre-motor cortex and Broca's area. The sensory area consists of the primary sensory cortex which is seen at the parietal lobe, visual cortex which is seen at the occipital lobe or auditory cortex which is seen at the temporal lobe and olfactory cortex also seen at the temporal lobe and gestatory cortex it is seen at the insula and frontal lobe. Now there is another system called the limbic system. Its main function is its emotions. It establishes emotional state. So it links the consciousness, intellectual functions of the cerebral cortex with autonomic functions of the brainstem. It facilitates the memory storage and retrieval. It makes you want to do a complex task. Its, its limbic system can also be called as motivation system, motivational system. So this session we discussed about the anatomy of the brain. So we'll go through this. We'll take some. We'll go through what are, what are the st things we studied already. So we divided the brain into two hemispheres, a cerebral uh, two and two hemispheres. And there is a two cerebellar hemispheres are also there. And there is a brainstem. So cerebral part is there. Brain consists of a cerebrum, cerebellum, and brainstem, which contain the midbrain which contain the midbrain, pons and medulla. Then cerebrum again we divide into different lobes and midbrain, uh, the brainstem can be divided, we divide into, uh, they can be divided into midbrain, pons and medulla. Then we studied about the cerebellum, its functions of the cerebellum and its main and what is happen what have will happen once there is a lesions to the cerebellum there will be chance of tremors there will be dysarthria there will be nystagmus there will be dysdiadokinesia and different types of hypotonia and posture also will get affected then thalamus main function we studied about the thalamus and its function hypothalamus and its functions like endocrine control its secretion its autonomic effects uh, it's it's a center a center of the autonomous nervous system we discussed about the temperature regulations of the hypothalamus then we discussed about the basal ganglia and how we, that is injury to the basal ganglia may cause the uh, may cause the the disease called the the syndrome called Parkinson's syndrome and internal capsule which is the major part where the fibers are passing through 
and we discussed about the cerebral cortex it can be divided into four lobes and we can divide it into different areas and uh, we discussed about the which are the different motor areas and sensory areas and that's all about the brain and there are some references you can go through the references which will help you to study more and understand more thank you